Welcome to another RD Works Learning Lab. I um, hope you can get a flavour of the time of year that I'm doing this. And um, it's about two and a half years now that I've had my machine. And it's a bit like building any puzzle. Once you've got the basic bits in place and you're only down to the last few pieces, things start to happen a lot quicker. And I think I've got a lot of the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle in place for this machine and I'm finding it easier and easier to answer questions. And we're going back today to look at one of the questions that we've touched on a couple of times before. And that is marks on the edge of acrylic. I'm going to involve you in a little project that I'm doing to see if we can come to a conclusive answer on this question. Today I'm going to manufacture a piece of test equipment which will remove that problem completely and so we can establish whether or not stepper motors have got anything to do with these marks on the edge of acrylic. Come and have a closer look and I'll show you what I'm trying to build. Well I happen to have some festive red perspex that we're going to use for this project but look what it's done to the table. All I did was to put that material on some 12 millimeter spacers to hold it off. But of course the condensate went down, hit this cold surface and condensed into this horrible red sticky muck. Now normally you wouldn't see it if it was clear perspex but it's still sticky and there. And as I may have mentioned a few times before, a little bit of acetone. Now you can't do that with a honeycomb table can you? Well let me take all the film off of these pieces and you can see that I leave the film on because where the start point happens you always get a little bit of a splurge of acrylic. The underside is nice and clean but the top side always has this mark where the start point is. Well here's the assortment of pieces we're going to use for this test fixture. I dug some of these pieces up from my varieties bin. It's a four start eight millimeter pitch lead screw and here we have a little synchronous motor which uh, is mains driven and it runs at 60 rpm. It doesn't matter whether it runs exactly 60 whether it's 61 or 59 the whole point of it is it is a synchronous motor which will run at a constant speed there are no steps on this motor so it will nominally generate obviously eight millimeters per second speed so we shall only have one speed to carry out this test but we can change the power to play with some of the parameters so let's assemble the pieces and see what this is all about these pieces here hopefully if I've made these the right size they're a nice going to be a nice snug fit on here because I, I could glue them on but I'm hopeful that I will be able to just push them on and it certainly looks that way Yep, they press on there nicely. And that one. Oh, that's superb. And that one. Now I might have to run a little bead of glue across the bottom of those, but at the moment I'm not going to. I think we just have to build the sides first. And let me pop that one in. And then pop that one on. Oops, make sure it's the right way around. And that should all just literally click together. And this is where my little helpers come in. And that goes in there. And that goes in there. So there we go. And now we've got a carriage. And then that plate there glues on there. And there's my test piece there. And I shall put my laser just there and we'll run across it like that. It's as simple as that. 
once it's glued together I won't be able to get this lead screw out so what I've done I've made a little plastic push on fitting there so it pushes on the motor snugly and it also pushes on there snugly so hopefully when I apply power to it now it will go one way I don't know which way um, it depends on this motor. I think it's probably clockwise. You see, I can't rotate that with the motor because it's very heavily geared, which is why I've made it a snug fit like that. So that when it's all at one end, I can take the motor off and just run it back to this end as well. And then to hold it all in line nicely, I'll put that end on, but I'm not going to glue this end on because I want this end to and clip. Well, it's not exactly an engineering masterpiece, but it should, with a bit of luck, do the job. It might be a little bit wobbly in this way, but at least it'll be moving along at a steady speed. So let's give it a try and see what we get. I've got the pulse set to about 65%, which is more or less maximum power for this machine. We'll turn the feed on. That's the cut that it produced. That was the normal machine cut with air assist and this was the machine cut without air assist. So we've got exactly the same sort of striations on there and just in case there's any risk of wobbly backlash or anything on there I've put some uh, I've put an elastic band around it this time to keep all the backlash one way. I mean, I know this is a bit of a bodge job, but hey, it's only got to work a few times just to prove the point. We need constant smooth motion. And from what I can see, we've nearly got it, but now we're absolutely certain we've got it with the backlash restraint on it. So we've got a two inch lens in there. The focus is set up on the surface. And what can I say? It's the worst cut I've ever seen. Now, this is the edge of that five millimeter red acrylic. Now, these are some of the worst striation cuts I've ever seen on acrylic. Truly abysmal. But this is five millimeters thick and it's cut from the right towards the left. And so we can see at the bottom a small amount of beam drag. Okay, now as we move along, there is a bit of a strange pattern that I can detect in the background and in fact if I defocus it the pattern becomes a little bit more obvious and as I rotate it in the light you can see all those blobs in the vertical direction now why would that be I wonder well I think I know the answer so let's take a look at some 3mm black acrylic and this time we're looking at the edge that has been cut by the laser normally with the stepper motor and yes we've still got the vertical striations on there but they're nowhere near as bad but the other interesting thing is if we look at it in the light as you can see we've got all these horizontal striations as well Now this is a cast acrylic, this is not extruded acrylic, so there's no layering in there from the actual material manufacturer itself. Those horizontal striations are in there for a, a very good reason I suspect. When you catch the light on the right they're very obvious aren't they, look. Now the, the striations are upright this time because the material is a lot thinner. We're still going 8 millimeters a second with the, with the same high power. So consequently we're burning through very quickly and we've got no beam drag. Now this is the same piece of black 3 millimeter material but on the other edge where it was cut with 
no stepper motor. I mean the edge is absolute rubbish with all those striations on there but you'll notice that the striations are vertical and then again if we take a look in this slightly out of focus picture I'm doing it to demonstrate that there are lots of again those horizontal patterns in the vertical striations and there we go look I'll just defocus it a little bit and you can see all those little blobs catching the light now we're moving on to a piece of two millimeter clear acrylic we've got all those horrible striations from the lead screw cut but again because this is thin material eight millimeters a second maximum power the lines are vertical because there is no beam drag But again, if I hold this in the light and maybe take it slightly out of focus, you can see again all those same telltale horizontal dots. Now, this is a rather strange view that I want you to get to sort of uh, to grips with. That black line there is a cut on the surface. And now I'm tipping the cut up in the air so that you're looking 45 degrees through the surface and what you can actually see there is the depth of the cut in the clear acrylic now there we go it's nicely in focus now we know that acrylic is very good as a velocity checker the deeper the cut the slower the head is going and the faster the head goes the shallower the cut gets so we have got quite a bit of very small change of speed going on there but look at that little block in the middle there all constant velocity but still lumps now there is no stepper motor here so they cannot be caused by stepper motion they must be caused by some other phenomenon it's proof that we have constant velocity just over those few steps. So let's go and examine what that phenomenon might be and where all these striations might be coming from. The laser beam is a coherent beam of light. It stays a stick of light. You can't see it, but it's still there, believe me. Now, you might think that it is a beam of heat because it sets fire to things. Not true. It's a beam of light. And that's the most important thing that you must not forget. You can't see it. It's in the infrared region where we cannot see. Now you're going to say, well, how can a beam of light set fire to a piece of paper? Well, that's what I'm going to try and describe to you, all about energy transfer. That's a quite a big subject dealing with quite a few sections of physics. Now, I'm not a physics teacher, I'm not a physicist, um, but I understand a little bit about the process. And what I want to do is hopefully, in a very simple way, get the principles of how this thing works. Because I'm running this laser at quite high power, I'm firing the beam down through a tray of water. And if we look carefully, you'll see that occasionally the surface is boiling. Now, I can make it boil more by raising something called the energy density. At the moment the beam is defocused because it's a one and a half inch lens where the focal point is probably only about five millimeters below the nozzle. And I've got about three inches there. So if I raise this up and bring the beam more into focus, look what happens. Yes. I'm boiling the surface of the water. Now I'm not making the water hot because the energy is literally just disappearing up in steam. And that's one of the things I want to try and explain to you later on. This is a very good demonstration of how it's only the surface of an object which gets heated. Well, I know what you're thinking. 
the only thing that makes water boil is heat. So where is that heat coming from? If it's not a beam of heat energy, it's a beam of light. I can't shine my torch at a bucket of water and make it produce steam. Now, what I've got here is a fascinating piece of material. Not the shape of it, but the material itself. It's acrylic, which you'll probably recognise. Now, it's eight millimetres thick, and I'm going to be using this material probably quite a few times throughout this demonstration because it's a fascinating material that has got some interesting properties when you fire a CO2 laser beam at it. The CO2 laser beam looks as though it is heat and heat causes this stuff to actually evaporate. It does not go through a liquid phase. It goes straight from a solid to a gas and so it's a great material to use to show us what's going on with the laser beam. And I've got my pulse set to 16% power, which is not very much power. I'm gonna hold the beam on, and I want you to watch carefully what happens. So you can see the vapor coming off. And now I'll stop. Did you see the liquid? just in there. There was just a small amount of liquid in there. Can you see this beautiful conical shape here? Now I'm going to do this again and I want you to note how long it takes for the for the surface to disappear and how the surface disappears. Okay let's go. It doesn't just go zoop and burn into the surface. Gradually it's eroding the surface, keeping the surface clean all the time. Can you see that? Now that's just burning the gas. Now can you see that liquid in there? And now the liquid is frozen. I want you to remember that bit there. Temperature, how fast atoms and molecules oscillate. That's the definition of temperature. Okay now, Here's our laser beam, as we've been talking about today, and it comes upon a surface. Now it could either be reflected back, and that happens on many pure metals. Things like gold, silver, copper, aluminium, they are about 99 or more percent reflective to our infrared wavelength and the special wavelength of the light that we have coming from our laser is 10.6 microns. Now that won't mean anything to most people um, but that's a number that you ought to remember because that particular wavelength has got some rather strange properties. If they're not reflected it's deemed that they are absorbed into the surface. Absorbed is a bit of a, an exaggeration. This light beam hits the surface and it is at a frequency with most organic materials and compounds that it can actually excite the atoms on the surface of the material. So these atoms just near the surface of the material can become very, very excited. And of course, where the t energy density is highest here, they become most excited. So we get this surface layer of atoms that are interacting with the light. The light is stimulating these atoms in the same way that you can understand your microwave. There's a certain frequency of waves in that microwave which are, which are stimulating the water molecules to heat up. Well, this is the same sort of thing, although it's not just limited to water. This particular wavelength can, can, can affect all sorts of materials. We're now starting to excite these materials on the surface. Whoa, hang about. If we're exciting these materials on the surface, what are we doing? Dun, 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 dun. We're making them oscillate faster. And when they oscillate faster, the temperature goes up. Hey, this is the mechanism by which we are turning light into heat. We have got an energy transfer that occurs at the surface of the material. We saw that happening 
With the water, if you remember, the surface of the water was boiling. It didn't penetrate into the water. It only affected a few surface atoms. Now, there may have been a small amount of heat transfer into the surrounding water, but it was very small. Most of the heat was being used and evaporated the water. When I asked you to observe what was going on with acrylic, we could see that this area here, where there was maximum energy density, was creating maximum excitement of atoms in the centre section here, and it was causing them to evaporate. And as they evaporated, we got a little bit of loss of material. And of course, the loss of material meant that there was a nice fresh layer of material there to evaporate and another fresh layer of material to evaporate. And so it went on in a little process like this. It wasn't where this energy was low here. You saw that there was sort of heating taking place, but no more evaporation. There was just this little liquid on the surface where we got the, the slight liquid phase of the material, but it was continuing to burn down at the bottom here where there was fresh material. So it was gradually creeping down little by little, but it was always working on the surface of the material. And that's what I must stress to you. This is a surface energy translation process. Now, what we saw today was the laser beam in its raw state. We were checking out what was happening with the energy level at a very low energy density. Now, although the energy density is not uniform across this beam, it is very now, the next low. thing to do is to take that beam and pass it through a lens. And when we pass it through the lens, we get a concentration of the beam down to a size of around about 0.1 millimeters in my particular case, where I had a, a, a one and a half inch lens. Let's realize we're talking about a beam that is somewhere in the region of about six millimeters diameter. And now we're going to squash it down to around about 0.1 millimeters. In other words, that area there is three and a half thousand times bigger than this area here. So we've got a huge energy density amplification at this point. So now what we've got is this situation here. We haven't changed the shape of the beam. We've still got the same energy density profile. It's a lens. It doesn't miraculously spread the energy out. What it does, it compresses the image down so that we've now got this same image, but it's only 0.1 of a millimetre diameter. So although we've got a three and a half thousand times compression, this has greatly, the energy density at this point here, has gone astronomical. So we have to bear in mind that we are not using the energy density at the levels I've been demonstrating to you today. We're using them at a much different and higher energy density. This is a very, very hot temperature that we can achieve with this little point of light energy. Now, I have clearly demonstrated to you how this surface is the little bit that boils away, leaving a clean material underneath to boil away. And you get this process happening. And you've seen that clearly demonstrated at low energy densities before the lens. Now bear in mind that the lens is amplifying this some 3,500 times. How does this effect happen after the lens? The process cannot physically change just because it passes through a lens. But of course, what will happen is the process will happen hundreds or thousands of times faster. And so now what will happen is, as the beam is traveling along, 
This is not like a bandsaw or a, a knife which is slicing through your material with a solid front like that. What's actually happening is the beam will very quickly produce, because it's a very, very narrow beam now, it will produce a series of cuts like this. And if you go slow enough, the cuts will be vertical. And you will get a vertical cut because this is happening very, 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 very fast. But if you go too fast, then what will happen is you will get this effect happening. I've demonstrated to you in an earlier session how acrylic has the ability to bend light around corners. Well, here we are. There's a classic example of that coming up now. We've got the light going down like this. And of course, the beam is now starting to move off. It's, it's still got enough energy to cut, but it's bending as it cuts. But as we start making the material thinner, of course, we've got enough time to cut straight through. Conversely, we slow the cutting down and we can make sure that we don't get any beam drag. But what's actually happening, these little cuts here are the dots that you're seeing on the vertical striations. So we've got two problems here. One, we're trying to untangle what these dots are and I hope that I've just demonstrated to you what those dots are. We don't have a continuous beam which is running along here. We've got basically a woodpecking beam, which, which does a little bit of work, clears the material away, and then does a bit more work before it clears the material away and does more work. This is an intermittent process, which is recorded by those little horizontal striations. Now the vertical striations are something different. They're caused by, again, another strange phenomenon, which is the gas cloud that forms around the cut. And then it moves across the gas cloud, finds new solid material, and starts cutting a new channel. And when we looked at the beam from above, we saw that what we'd got, we'd got a series of overlapping cuts like this. And these here, the intersection of those cuts are the striations that we see on the edge of the material. Now, that's nothing to do with the stepper motor. And we saw that today when we looked at that little section of burn marks, depth burns, where they were all completely uniform, but we had all these little marks, right? We were moving with, because I'd reduced the power so much, all we were doing was putting little burn marks on the surface moving across and putting more burn marks on, like these. Now we also looked at the edge finish the, on the black material, which was done with the normal stepper motor drive. And one has to admit that it was substantially better than the lead screw striations that we produced when there was no stepper motor involved. So we know that the stepper motor does not cause these little striations. But what it might do is give us some actual benefit. Hadn't really considered this before as a possibility, but when we cut acrylic, we're normally working at very low speeds, 10, 15, 20 millimeters a second. And at that speed, our stepper motors are in micro stepping mode. They are producing very, very small step increments. Now, bear in mind what I said to you here, this, the, the depth of this cut tells us what is going on with the head. We've got virtually a constant speed because we've got the same depth of cut, but we have got an intermittent cut of some sort, but in this particular instance, I'm totally convinced that it's caused by this pecking action. All right, so we've got nice little uniform pecks here as the motor is moving along. But when we looked at the other side, the stepper motor side of the cut, it was substantially better. It had striations this way, if you remember, but it had lots and lots of very, very small striations that way. Now it is possible that the striations that way are basically these cuts but they're taking place fast enough 
every time the stepper motor jumps to a new micro step. And it's the micro stepping that's allowing the cuts to fire through at a much higher interval than would naturally occur if we were just dragging this thing along at a steady speed. So steady speed looks as though it's causing coarse striations and an intermittent speed looks as though it's causing a much better cut. Now, that wasn't a conclusion that I was expecting to reach from this sort of work. Well, I hope that I've demonstrated to you today with just a little bit of scientific knowledge and some good observation and a bit of jumping to conclusions. Now, if you understand this mechanism that's going on, maybe it will help you with some of your finish problems with your product. Anyway, thank you very much for your time and patience and I'll catch up with you in the next session. Oh, and by the way, happy Christmas to you all.